Good morning. It is good to have all of you here with us in the room and as well as all of those who uh, are at home. We do hope at some point you can come and visit us or, or if you are home because of the snow, we're grateful that we can still worship together. Before I start my sermon, I wanted to let Ashley tell you a little bit about what we have going on on Wednesday nights and invite you to that. It's, it's a great ministry that I'm looking forward to participating in this time also. So Ashley, come on up. Good morning, church. So I have an announcement for you all. There is a flyer in your bulletins that says Wednesday Small Groups. Now, this is an amazing opportunity for each and every one of you in here that I would love for you to pray about if God is calling you to. What we have going on on Wednesday nights is we are going to be meeting starting January 17th in the Fellowship Hall. We're going to do dinner together, and then we're going to have kids stay in the gym. They get some really fun playtime. Well, they, we have two different adult options. One of them is going to be an alpha small group. This group is perfect for those of you that want to know more how to tell others about Jesus, or even better yet, if you want to bring somebody along with you that doesn't yet know Jesus or is brand new to the faith and wants to learn more. This class is an environment where you can ask questions, where if you do not have it all together, if there's stuff in your faith that you've struggled with, if there are some really, really tough questions that in a Sunday school class you might feel uncomfortable to ask, this is the class that covers all of that. So what I would encourage you to do for the Alpha class is pray about, first of all, if God is calling you to go to this class and learn about how to tell others about Jesus, or if God is calling you to invite someone to this class, someone that doesn't know him, and that you could even attend the class with them. I don't know about you, but I know for me, I hate going anywhere alone. If I have to go to a function and I'm not sure who's going to be there, there's a little bit of panic that sets in for me. And if I know there's going to be a familiar face there, somebody to greet me, somebody that is going to kind of stay by my side, that helps so much. I hate to say that, that's even the case in a uh, setting where I feel comfortable and familiar. Even in this church, when I know who's going to be there and I know that there's going to be a familiar face, it helps me. So think about if you are inviting someone to this that's never been to our church, that doesn't know anyone else, it's a huge hurdle to come here on their own. So what I would encourage you to do, pray about first, if somebody, if God is calling you to invite one person or one family to attend this, and secondly, if God is calling you to go through this with them, to be that familiar face, to be that face greeting them and saying, I'm going to sit next to you in this class. I'm going to go through it with you. So that's option one. Option two, we have a new class we're offering called Believer's Basics. Pastor Carolyn and Renee Skinner are going to be leading it. And that is basically once you've completed Alpha, once you know who Jesus is, it's the basics of how to follow him. So what does it really mean now that you know Christ? So if you know somebody that already has a faith but is just getting started and wants to know how to continue on in that journey, this is the perfect class for them. So please, once again, be praying about how God is calling you to get involved. It's exciting to see God starting to stir in hearts and draw people to himself. And we're hoping to see brand new baby Christians come out of this. And if that is the case, I hope that when they show up in here, that you would welcome them with open arms and help to feed them in this environment. But first, we got to bring them in to get them to know who Jesus is. So be praying about it, and thank you so much. Thanks, Ashley. And don't take my sermon notes. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been interesting. <laughs> Let's pray together. Holy God, we do thank you that you are a God who pursues us. You are a God who welcomes our questions and our doubts and our, our wonderings. Oh Lord, we thank you that we have opportunities to talk about you and explore you that, that are, are good for the, the earliest believers and all the way through to those who've been Christians all of their lives. Oh Lord, you are that big that you can handle all of that. 
Lord, we pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on us as a congregation and on us this morning as we open your word. Lord, make your word come alive for us. Quicken our hearts and our minds so that we can, can hear the word and understand it. Awaken our ears that we, we can not only hear but comprehend and make us not only hearers but doers also. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, as Pastor Sinda mentioned, we are starting a new sermon series today on the book of Gen Genesis. This is not a verse-by-verse -verse series. This is six weeks of a really long, intense book. <laughs> so think 50,000-foot view. But I, I want, some people have never, ever studied Genesis, and there's, you, you, it's kind of mythology. But we want to see what God has to say to us. It is the inspired word of God, and every single sentence and and, and word is important and it tells us something about who God is and about who we are and how we fit within creation. So let's start today. We're going to be studying um, chapters one through three. So it is, again, a pretty quick overview. I'm just going to read a part of, of one and then um, a, a short verse from Colossians. So this is Genesis 1, starting with verse 1. In the beginning, God. <laughs> In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface, of the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated light from darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And skipping down to verse 26, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And then turning over to Colossians 1, this is Paul uh, just marveling at who Jesus is. This is 115 to 20. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth Visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all, all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. When I first graduated from, um, from college, I moved to D.C. and found a church on Capitol Hill and um, met a bunch of really amazing people and, and got into a small group. And we, after we'd been together for a little while, we decided to tackle Genesis. It's like, okay, we can do this. And, and this amazing group of people, we started digging in. We did it for about six months before I got called by, I was, again, working for World Vision. Um, I got called to move to uh, California. And then as soon as I touched down in California, I went to Africa for like almost a year. <laughs> and then I came back. Um, and when I was in Africa, they moved my job from California back to DC. That's a very long story. Uh, but I came back to this small group because, you know, that was my friends. And what, guess what they were still studying? Genesis. <laughs> so like a year and a half, at least, and it still took them. I think they were, you know, about five chapters from the end when I came back. 
But you can spend an awful lot of time <laughs> in the book of Genesis. As I've been, I was talking actually to one of the elders this week, and, and he's like, well, what are you going to focus on? And I'm like, well, I could do this, and I could do that. <laughs> like, there's so much, even in the first chapter. I actually found a book that the entire book is on the first chapter of Genesis. <laughs> so we could spend a whole lot of time. Today I'm going to try to introduce the whole thing uh, and talk about the first three chapters. So again, I can't get into minutia. We're going to be looking at the, the overarching themes. Uh, but the four things that we can respond to when we look at these three things, if, if, if you don't remember anything else about this, the four things are worship, prayer, which is a relationship with God, worship, prayer, repentance, and hope. We're going to look how this creation story leads us into worship. We just have sung several songs about, about the worship of God because of his creation. We, we started with Psalm 8 that was all about worshiping God and his creation. We're going to talk about prayer and how God created humans to be in relationship with him. And then we're going to talk about repentance, which is the right response to chapter 3 and the fall. And finally, the hope of Jesus Christ that is already written into Genesis. We don't see Jesus for many more books of the Bible, but, but he's already there, even at the, at the very beginning. So uh, one of my favorite moments in, uh, <laughs> as we do ministry, I, I often get to do Stump the Pastor with, uh, with Fired Up Friday. The kids can ask me any random question they want one time. Uh, Rosie Chamberlain just grilled me for about 10 minutes on like every fa rapid fire question she could think of about the Genesis. Uh, but one of my favorite questions always is, when was God born? And then I try to explain eternity to them. And you can see their minds just going, pew. <laughs> In the beginning, God. God was there from the very beginning. There was nothing else before God. He was always there. Now, Genesis, the context that we need to think about Genesis is not a science book. This is not meant to, like, it was, it was written long, long, long ago. They weren't asking the same questions that we ask now. Um, this is written in the, in the ancient Near East. Lots of different places have different creation stories. Most of the creation stories are, you know, the god of the sea, who's the god of chaos, fights the god of the land, or, or you know, there are all these different hierarchies, and so-and-so's brother fights this guy, and, and, and all of that. But the point as we read the Genesis account, these are all these gods warring against each other. The point is that God created everything everybody else worshipped as a god. God created the heavens. He created the earth. He created the moon. He created the sun. Everything all of these other people worshipped as gods, lowercase g, plural, our God created. There is one God who made heaven and earth. And that is the point that we want to, to, to hang with as we go through this story, is that our God is the one who spoke. There's the word. We remember John 1, the, the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. God spoke that word, and creation came into being. As we think about all of this, we, we see all of those layers. But, but again, worship is the first response as we see all that God has made, as, as we think about all that it means that God, his nature is good and he creates something beautiful. Uh, on the um, e-letter this, this week, I posted a picture that is from the, the new web telescope that's taking incredible pictures of deep space. And to see the wonders of God that, you know, humans didn't see for thousands of years and now we have the capacity to see and we see more and more about the beauty of God's creation. All the things that, that he put into being by, by speaking a word. <laughs> Some of you have probably heard me tell this joke, but I love this. Um, so, you know, a bunch of scientists figured out how to create life. So they, just, they decided to, to challenge God to a duel. Um, so God's like, all right, you know, let's see what you got. And so the scientists came together and they started gathering their dirt. And God leans over and goes, hey, get your own dirt. <laughs> That is the simplest way I know to explain that God made nothing into something. 
He made absolutely nothing, even the dirt, into something. Or like there was nothing, and he created the dirt. He created all of it. He spoke, and it came into being. He brought order and into the chaos. He, he, and, and you see, even at the very, very beginning, the three members of the Trinity, there's the word that is spoken, that's Jesus. There's the spirit hovering over the waters, that's the Holy Spirit. The ruach is the, the Hebrew word, which means wind and spirit. So we see God already at work, already in relationship with himself, and then breathing all of this into being. It's just an incredible moment as we see that. A lot of people get bogged down when you read chapter one in, um, in the creation evolution debate. Uh, I've, I've, one thing to, to keep in mind, there are lots of different ways to be a creationist, to, to, to believe that God created it all. We don't have to say it's a six-day, a six 24-hour day. The sun wasn't even created until day four. Um, but we can believe that these were, were times, seasons. We don't know how long the time was between verse 1, God cre in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and then in verse 2, the next thing that he does. That could have been billions of years. Um, th there's a, a place that I, a website that I think is really helpful at an organization called BioLogos, B-I-O-L-O-G-O-S, BioLogos.com, I think. Um, it's an organization founded by Christian people who are scientists, and they are uh, proclaiming creation is not in, and God's creation is not in, in opposition to science. You can be a thoughtful, well, well-ordered science, scientist and also believe that God created it all. So if you have questions about that, I would point you there. I'm not going to go into details today, but it's, it's really helpful to me to know that there are really solid scientists who still believe that this is true, that God spoke and all, everything came together. The, the application of this, of seeing how God created all of it, the birds, the air, the, just the sun, the sky, the stars, everything, the response to that is always worship. As, as we look at things, you've probably seen pictures of you know, microscopic images that are so carefully put together. It's the, the guy that founded BioLogos actually was a microbiologist, and he was, I, I think he was agnostic. But the more he studied microbiology, the more he saw the fingerprint of God. And it led him to worship, and it led him to faith. So all creation proclaims the glory of God, as it says in Psalm 19. Our first response as we read the creation story is worship. That's, we, we, I talked a couple of years ago, I talked about the formula for prayer. The first word is wow, thanks, help. <laughs> um, the first response is wow. And when you read chapter 1, just hang out with the wow, the awe, the majesty, the wonder of what God did and all that he created. The second part of this is, is prayer, is the relationship that God invites us into through praying, through spending time with him. In those ancient Near East myth, uh, myths about creation, one of them, uh, an old Babylonian myth, was that the, the gods created humans in order to dig ditches for them. <laughs> The, the lesser gods used to have to dig ditches, and the gods decided, well, that's a pain. So let's create these slaves and minions to do what we want to do. And that's why they created them. That is so not what the Bible says. The Bible says that God, God creates humans because he, he wants to be in relationship with them. He doesn't just create little underlings. He creates people in the image of God. He, and God says, let us create them in our image. So God as Trinity, as, as God in relationship, wants to create people in relationship as well. And we know that God walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the afternoon, um, that, that he was able to spend time with them and be in relationship with them. He wanted to make them, uh, you know, capable of, of relationship with himself. And he also created Eve with Adam, not out of his head to be above him, not out of his feet to be below him, but out of his side to be beside him. They were created equal so that they could be, uh, support one another. The only not good in the Bible before the fall is it is not good for man to be alone. Think about what that means. I mean, loneliness is absolutely epidemic in our society. 
And a lot of Christians are very alone, but there's this funny self-sufficiency among Christians. It's like, I got this, it's me and God. I don't need anybody else. This creation story tells us that we are made to be in relationship with others, not just us and God, but us together. And I know many of you are single, and that is hard. I've lived it myself for a really long time. But our relationship, if it, it, even if we're in families, but especially if we're not in families, our relationship comes from the fellowship with other Christians. We need each other so that we can, um, can see who God is based on, on what he's promised and, and how he's filling those promises. We can encourage one another when we're down. We can pray for one another. Oh, we support one another because we are family. We are brothers and sisters in this relationship with each other and in relationship with God. So the application to that, to that, that idea of how we were made to be in relationship, the, the application is prayer to be in relationship with God, to spend time with him, not just to say, okay, God, here's my list, but, but to truly enjoy. Uh, the, the first question of the Westminster Shorter Catechism is, what is the chief purpose of, of humans? It's to glorify God and enjoy him forever. It's, it's not just, hi, God, what are my marching orders? Or here, God, do this for me. It's we're supposed to come together and enjoy him. Imagine before the fall what that was like for Adam and Eve to enjoy God with no shame and no guilt and no regrets, nothing between them. They were able to pray and be in relationship. And that is the call that we have as well, that we need to be in relationship with God and in relationship with each other. Each, each, each of us being made in the image of God. And that is something I want you to remember, especially because this is an election year. Every single person who votes differently than you do is also made in the image of God. And we need to respect that. We need to honor that in, in one another. We need to, to, to pray into that. Lord, you created these people. Fill them with your Holy Spirit. Give them wisdom. We need to, to and Jesus makes it really hard. Love those who persecute you. Uh, all of those things. Love your enemies. God wants us to love one another because we are created in the image of God, no matter what our origin is, no matter what race or ethnicity or nation or whatever. It is all, every one of us is created in the image of God. And we are in relationship because of that creation. And, he, and we are to, to forgive one another and bless one another and pray for one another in, in, that, in that relationship. The next thing that we look at then is the fall. In chapter three, you remember the story as, as the serpent comes up and, and says to Eve, you know, did God really say? <laughs> Eve had been, Adam had been told first, before, even before Eve was created, that he was not to eat, um, eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil or he would surely die. And the, the, as soon as, as Eve is around, the serpent tries to go after her and says, you know, look, it's beautiful. <laughs> Just try it. Um, one of the commentaries I was reading says this. He's talking about the blessing that God gives, and, and the Garden of Eden was full of blessing. He says, those who are blessed by God have a vibrant and healthy relationship with him, with each other, and with the world in which they live. As we turn to the second act of the biblical story, the fall, we read about Adam and Eve's sin, which forfeited divine blessing. God had said, I'm going to bless you. And then they're like, you know, thanks, God. I'm going to do my own thing. This, this, uh, this guy also re uh, said that sin is, is human, sub human substitute their own ideas of right and wrong in the place of God's definition. They are thinking that, you know, God, you've got a good plan. You've done some really nice stuff, but now it's our turn. We're going to take over now. That's what sin is. Sin is thinking that we don't need God. We don't need to submit to his order of right and wrong. It's we're going to go our own way. And we see that in this story. And it's, it's really interesting in it, when you're reading the Old Testament, um, in the, especially the narratives, every single detail is there for a purpose. It, it, 
Hebrew narratives tend to be really sparse in detail. So if a detail is there, it's on purpose. And the timing of it, where it is in the story, also makes an impact. So we don't hear at the very beginning that Eve, that Adam is standing right next to Eve. It's not until she eats the apple that we find out that Adam was there the whole time. Adam could have stopped her. He could have, have intervened. He didn't even say anything. He just takes and eats. He's in this passive role and doesn't stand up for what God had told him. So Adam is just as culpable as Eve in the, in the middle of the situation. God created Adam and Eve as innocent. They weren't perfect. They were innocent. And that's an interesting distinction. Jesus Christ was perfect. Uh, he was able to not sin at all. Adam and Eve had a moral choice. They had the ability to make a moral decision, um, to, to choose one way or the other. God created them with that. He, and, and, and sure enough, as soon as they realize they have the ability to choose, they choose badly. But God knew, even in that moment, that he had a plan beyond that. We, we see that, um, that, that everything because of their decision becomes cursed. All of the decisions they make, all of the work they have to do, labor and childbirth, all of it gets hard. The, the ground gets hard. There are thorns and thistles now. Everything that they're going to encounter because they chose their way instead of God's way becomes, becomes hard. The, the, the application for this story is that you and I are also broken. We have gone our own way. I loved, if you were here at the 5 o'clock Christmas Eve service, Ashley read a book, and the, the way it defined sin was they no longer treated God as king. And wow, how many different ways do we not treat God as king over our lives? He is our friend. He is our love. He is so many things, but he's also our Lord. He's the one that, that defines what right and wrong is. And we're like, you know, thanks, God, for that advice. I'm going to do this instead. So the response to our brokenness is repentance. To say, Lord, I am sorry. I have put myself in front of you. The, the confession that we just read talks about our desires. We desire things other than God. We desire things differently than God desires for us. And the, the point is not just to repent of, of the thing we did, but also our desire for that. Uh, any way that we are longing to fulfill the hole in our heart with something other than God, any of those desires that are not rightly ordered, we come to the Lord and we repent and we say, Lord, don't, don't just change, you know, don't just forgive me for that thing, but change my desire, change my heart. Help me long for the things that you long for. May my heart uh, be broken for the things that break the heart of God. And that's your own life as well as, as what's going on out there. We want to, to repent so that that relationship can be restored. And we remember in the middle uh, of all of these curses, there's a, a spark of hope. And that's the, that's the fourth piece. So we've talked, about, uh, we've talked about worship. We've talked about prayer and relationship. We have uh, talked about repentance. The final piece is hope. Where do we place our hope? Our hope is that God knew all along. He knew from even before the earth was formed. It says in Revelation, the lamb who was slain before the foundations of the world. He knew that he would have to send a rescuer. Uh, someone to, to bring Adam and Eve and all of humanity up out of this pit we dug for ourselves. To restore us into right relationship with, with the Lord. It's, it says um, in, in Genesis 3.15, and I will put enmity, he's, he's talking to Eve, I'll put enmity between, oh, excuse me, he's talking to Satan, put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. So this crush the head, the, the promise that the, the serpent will be defeated is there from the very beginning. And that is pointing, and it's even quoted in the New Testament, it's pointing to Jesus Christ. That passage I just read from Colossians, the end of it, um, says, Through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Jesus Christ, who was there from the very, very beginning, who was slain for the world even from the beginning. He is the one who was sent to reconcile us with the Father. 
Our hope is in Jesus Christ. He came to earth. He shed his blood. He died. He rose again. And he promises us in the last day to bring us all together with no more sin and no more sorrow and no more sighing and tears. To be completely restored to the presence of God and to, to have nothing standing between us and God like Adam and Eve at the beginning didn't have anything between them and God. That is the hope that we hold on to as we come to communion. Communion is, a, is a, a, a remembering and a telling of those promises that Jesus Christ came to earth and he, excuse me, allowed himself to be broken. He allowed himself to, to, for his blood to be shed. He allowed himself to die for us, his hope. And the hope that we have in him is that he is vanquishing all of the things that have gone wrong and restoring, uh, restoring that right relationship. And the promise, even as we celebrate communion, even as we look at the past, we also look to the future. The promise of the wedding feast of the Lamb, that, that there will be consummation of all of this, a fulfillment of all the promises, a restoration of everything, and not just restoration, but something even greater than we can ask or imagine. God is restoring all things to himself so that we can find our life and our identity and our hope in him. Brothers and sisters, as we study the book of Genesis, as we look around the world around us and all the fingerprints of God, my prayer is that you will find ways to worship God, not just on Sunday mornings, but when you're in the middle of a snowstorm or in the middle of your family, that you can see that God is at work and God has done amazing things in creation. My hope is that you will grow in prayer, um, that you will grow in your relationship with God by talking to him, by reading his word, and by fellowshipping with other Christians so that we together can be iron sharpening iron and, and, and helping one another grow closer to the Lord. My prayer is that as you draw closer to the Lord, you'll see how many ways that we are not holy as God is holy. And know that repentance, like Pastor Cinda said, it's, it's, it's healing. When we repent of what's been holding us down, it heals us and draws us, cleanses us, and sets us free so that we can be free and reconciled in our relationship with God. And above all, every single day, we can hope in the promise of the Lord that he is leading us and guiding us and providing for us every single moment of every day. Jesus Christ is our hope, and it's in his name that we speak all of these things and rely on him. Amen. Let's pray together. Holy God, we do thank you and we praise you that you have created heaven and earth. And who are we that you are mindful of us? You know the number of hairs on our head. You know the number of days of our lives. But you are with us every single step of the way and from now until all of eternity. Holy God, we ask that you would be with us, that you would turn our hearts to worship, that we would be uh, transformed not by worshiping creation, by, but by worshiping the creator. Lord, help us to see you in everything that we, we experience every day. Uh, Lord, help us to draw close to you in relationship through prayer. Help us draw close to one another as we forgive one another and bear up one another's burdens and, and walk alongside each other as, as we spur one another on. Lord, help us to see all that is not of you in our own hearts. Lead us to repentance. Lead us to follow you, not just in our deeds, but in our desires, so that we can seek you and reflect you wherever we go. Lord, we do place our hope in you. This is a broken world. We have broken places in our hearts. We have broken places in our nation and around the world with wars and rumors of wars, but you are the Prince of Peace. You are the God of reconciliation. And we lay it all in your hands. Lord, we know that this story today is not the end, that there will come a time when all of it is restored to the perfect new heavens and new earth that you are bringing to pass. Lord God, we pray for those among us that are, are wrestling with this broken world, whether through illness of their own or a loved one, or those who have recently lost loved ones, especially over the holidays, or those for whom this was the first holiday without someone that they loved. Lord, we pray that you would bless those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. 
that you would, would lead everyone to see how you are walking alongside them, even in what feels an awful lot like the valley of the shadow of death. Lord, we pray that you would continue to help us to reflect your desire to reconcile all people to yourself, that not only as we draw close to you, we would also want to tell others about you, that, that they too can be set free and healed and brought into your presence. Oh Lord, we pray for our city and for our, our township. We pray that you would be present here, that you would show us who you want to draw to yourself. Help us to be full, so full of your Holy Spirit that, that it spills out into blessing and joy for others. Oh Lord, we lift all of these things up to you, and we, we thank you for who you are. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, please rise now as we confess our faith through the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.